In this video, I'm going to show you the basics of schema management through Hasura. And I'm going to pick up where the last video left off, which is that we have a local instance of Hasura running through Docker and that we can get to the console uh, by going to a, a, a port on our local machine. As this uh, handy pop up is telling us, the first thing we actually need to do uh, is connect to a database and uh, then tells you to go watch their course. But you don't want to do that. You want to follow my course. So let's not show that again. So we'll start by clicking on the data tab. And here we're going to uh, configure a database that we want to store our data in. Now, the first thing is I'm going to call it default. And that's because uh, it's probably not too important. But uh, in very uh, recent Hasura history, they started supporting multiple data sources. Um, before uh, version two, this wasn't possible. And so uh, default can be a useful way of maintaining backward compatibility um, if you're ever using like an older version of uh, the Hasura CLI or something. Occasionally, I find there are situations where it's useful that that's called default. Uh, but it's not critical if you want to name it something else. I'm going to use a, a Postgres uh, database. And in fact, I'm going to use the exact same database um, that we already saw in the previous video that we, uh, we've configured for our Hasura metadata. I think it's probably quite common just to use the same database. I can't imagine many situations where you'd need to use uh, a different one. So that means I need to type a database connection string in here. You can see the format is pretty straightforward. Basically, it's just a way of providing the username, the password, the host name, and everything of the database. I'm going to be particularly lazy and go back to the Docker Compose file and just copy the exact same connection string here. You shouldn't run into any problems using the same database because it's going to create tables with, uh, with different names. So I don't usually find that's a problem. And as a result, you'll now see that there's a entry under databases for default and uh, that there's a schema called public. And that is where we are going to put our uh, tables. So let's go ahead and create a table for our blog. So I'm going to create the most obvious table you're going to want in a blog, which is the blog post table. My posts are going to have an ID and I'm going to use an auto incrementing integer for that. So that's nice and simple to do through Hasura. I'm going to add a title, which is text. I'm going to add the actual blog post content, which is also text. I'm going to add the date and be careful here. Don't actually choose date because that's a date without a time. I guess maybe that makes the, the column name a little bit misleading, but it's usually how these things are um, referred to. We call them dates when really we mean timestamp. So you'll want to choose that. I'm going to add an is published flag so that I can have sort of draft uh, you know, draft uh, blog posts. So that's a Boolean. Finally, a user ID, and I'll be using this more later on. So for now, this is just going to be some text and I'm going to allow uh, the user ID to be nullable. I'm also going to put in a default for date. And this is where Hasura could be pretty cool. Like it automatically, because you see it, because it can see it's a date, it automatically suggests now. So I'm going to put that in so that every time we insert a new blog post entry, uh, the date is automatically set to the current date and time. And uh, why don't we set the uh, is published to false by default? I think that would make sense. We need to choose a primary key. That obviously is going to be the ID. And uh, I think for now, that's all I want. So that's nice and simple. And as you can probably tell, that's now created a table in your database. So essentially, that's just uh, run some simple SQL commands to, to create that for you. So that was nice, but might not seem like a big deal. But this is where Hasura is really cool. If you go to the API tab, what you'll see is that by creating that table, Hasura has now automatically created us um, some queries and mutations for the GraphQL API. So just in case you're not familiar, a query in GraphQL is anything which retrieves data without affecting the state of the underlying data. And a mutation is the same thing, except it's something that does change um, the underlying state. So queries will be for fetching data. Mutations will be for inserting, deleting, um, updating, and so on. So I'm going to write a simple GraphQL query. Um, so it gives you this, this really nice view for testing your API. And I'll start by writing a mutation. So this is how you write GraphQL mutations. And already, so I'm pressing Control Space, by the way, to bring up these suggestions. Already, we've got all of these um, automatically 
generated endpoints, which I think is uh, is uh, really cool. And I'm going to insert a blog post into my table. I'm actually going to choose insert blog post one. Uh, the, the other one without one uh, is for inserting multiple blog posts. And uh, it suggests everything along the way. So even if you're not quite sure exactly how Hasura is going to automatically generate this API and exactly what it's going to look like, it kind of guides you along anyway. So you can see that there is a, uh, a, uh, an input argument called object. And uh, if you put some curly brackets for that, you'll then see it'll tell you um, that what it's looking for are the fields that we uh, already created. So um, I'm going to create my first blog post. And uh, the content, let's just put hello world. And then I don't think I need to put anything else because um, what else have we got? The ID is generated, the date is generated, is published, will be false. And I'm just going to leave that null for now. That's kind of for later. So that's almost all I have to do. You'll see that it does also do some syntax checking, which is really nice. And what it's currently complaining about is that uh, with GraphQL, you always have to say what selection of fields you would like to be returned from your query. It's one of the defining features of GraphQL, which can make it uh, really flexible and efficient from the front end point of view. You always say, I want to make this mutation, but what I want to return back is, and then uh, probably makes sense to have the ID, given that that's auto generated. I suppose we could also, let's have the auto generated date come back as well. So I'm going to run that. And you see it's successful. We've got a blog post with uh, ID one, obviously. And so now let's get rid of this and perform a query that lists all of the blog posts. And you'll find that that is just called blog post. That's what that one means. And again, you need to say which fields you want to return. Uh, let's do the title and the content. And if we run that, you'll see that we now fetch the blog post uh, that we just got. So what's really cool about this is that this is uh, an API that your front end uh, could now start consuming. It's actually uh, ready to do that. Um, and all we had to do was create that table. Uh, everything else was done for us. Obviously, we're missing some things that probably will be quite important, like authentication. But if you just wanted something simple, just a, a simple, uh, you know, comments system or something like that, that's basically it. We've already got something that a front end could start working against. Speaking of the front end, I will show you how to run the front end that I've created um, at the end of this video. But there's a few more tables that we need to create first of all. So I'll just demonstrate a few more ideas um, and then we'll go ahead and, uh, and get the front end running. So there's another table I want to make, um, which is called blog post activity. So the idea is that on my blog post, I want to have kind of like, um, I guess, a, a history uh, for each blog post that is going to have the record of uh, certain events that occurred to it, like uh, when it was created, when it was published, uh, maybe it was unpublished, maybe it was updated at a certain, and uh, have the date and time for all of these things. And I'm going to do that by having another table called blog post activity. Each record is again going to have a, an ID. And then there's also going to be a blog post ID. So each, uh, each row in this table is going to uh, refer to a particular blog post. So uh, that will be an integer because obviously that's the, uh, that was the data type of the, the ID on the other table. There's going to be a type, which I'll just leave as a, as a string. So this is going to be something like created or published or something um, to represent some activity that's happened to a blog post. Uh, and then there's going to be the date and time that it happened. So again, timestamp. And again, I will choose that as now. So we'll pick the primary key as ID. And uh, as you probably guessed, we want to add a foreign key. So um, we're referencing the blog post and the uh, blog post ID column on this table refers to the ID of the blog post on the other table. I'll just leave the defaults for all this stuff for now. So we'll go ahead and add that table. And then I want to go back to the API again. And um, I'm also going to insert some, uh, some entries uh, for this table. Uh, mainly because I want to demonstrate another cool, interesting feature of Hasura. So let's insert a few blog post activity records. Uh, let's uh, get that out of the way. So if you recall, the ID of the first blog post that we made was one. So that's what I'll put as the ID for that. And let's put the type as created and it'll use the uh, current time and date. 
Oh, and I've missed a colon up there, so I'm making a right mess of it. So you, again, we need to say what we want to return. So why don't we return the ID and also the date? So essentially, when, as soon as I insert this record, it's going to say that the uh, blog post number one was created at whatever the current time and date is. There we go. And then a few seconds later, let's also just insert a published one as well and just pretend it was published, um, which is not really going to I mean the is published flag is still false, but we'll worry about that later. Point is, I just wanted to create a, a couple of records so I can show you something. So if you imagine from the point of view of the front end, we want to get all the blog posts and we might want to show the activity for all the blog posts as well. And we now have the ability to do that. We can, you know, we can query all of the blog posts easily. And uh, we can also query all of the blog post activity records if we want to. Um, and uh, you can narrow those down. Hasura has some quite nice, initially a little bit hard to get your head around, but some quite nice um, parameters that you can pass into all these queries uh, to, to write a where clause. So you could, for example, write uh, where, and I think that's an object, and then uh, what would you say, blog post ID, uh, and then that's an object, and then you say equals one, for example. It's going to be the same result in this case, but that sort of shows how you could get all of the activity for one record or for a certain set of records. But what would be nicer really is if we had a bit more flexibility um, because what we might want to do is get a blog post uh, or get a set of blog posts and also get all of the activity records for each of those blog posts. And if you're working, you know, this is something you would do with a traditional REST API anyway, and it's probably something you'd have to manually implement. You'd sort of, you sort of have to make a decision, you know, there's a trade-off do I get the blog post and all of the activity records all at once and you know, essentially make two queries? Or do I uh, require the front end to make uh, separate queries there? Uh, because you don't want situations where you fetch all of the activity records and actually they weren't used by the front end because then that would be wasteful. Maybe you pass in a parameter to, to decide whether or not uh, you should fill those in. Well, one of the ideas behind GraphQL is that you, uh, if you design it right, you actually remove all of those questions from the uh, equation. And I'll show you how, and I'll show you how Hasura in particular has really good uh, support for this. If we go back to our data and we go to our blog post and then click on relationships, what we can do is we can add fields to, uh, to our objects, to our uh, tables, uh, sort of computed fields that will make another query automatically for linked data if the uh, request queries it. And because we've already got a foreign key set up here where the, uh, you know, the blog post activity uh, has a foreign key that links to the uh, blog post ID, Hasura has already actually guessed what relationship we might want. It suggested it here. It's suggesting that the blog post activity, blog post ID is in fact, uh, you know, maps onto the blog post ID, which it does. And if we click add, we can then give the name of the field. I'm just going to call it activities rather than blog post activities. That'd be nicer. And what that's done is it's added a field called activities onto the blog post uh, table. Uh, it's uh, obviously it's not stored at the database level. This is stored at the Hasura level. And I'll show you why this is really cool. Because now we can, uh, let's say, fetch all of the blog posts in the database. And, you know, we can do what we did before and get the ID and the title and the content and the date. But we can also choose to get activities. So that means we can drill down into this. This is where the graph uh, part of GraphQL's name comes from, because you're um, sort of uh, you're able to query on the links between uh, between nodes, between records, and you can do that you know as, as deep as the API allows you to. So we can now say, I want to get all the activities, and on that particular entity, I want to get the type and the date, for example. And you run that, and Hasura has made that really easy for us. We've now got all the we've got all the information for our blog post, and also all of the activity records because we asked for it. And if we didn't put that field, it wouldn't bother making that additional query. I think that's a, a really nice feature that uh, that can save you a lot of time. Probably just worth emphasising there's something I touched on as well, which is that um, you know that activities field does not exist at the database level. This is something that exists in Hasura's 
uh, sort of schema definition. Um, and it, it affects the API, not the database. The foreign key was the thing that happened at the database level. And so it maybe is a bit odd that you kind of have these two concepts, but that's something you'll see that's a recurring theme in Hasura, which is that it keeps the, uh, the database schema level kind of separate from the, uh, the upper level, the Hasura API level. It's usually clear uh, where the difference lies. And I think it does it so that uh, even when you define, even if you're defining a whole database through Hasura, what you end up with at the database level is still a very sensibly designed and workable database that you could make queries to uh, directly if you wanted to. You could have some other service that's sending SQL uh, queries to the actual underlying database. And all that would still make sense. You know, the, the schema would be sensibly designed. It's got its foreign keys set up and everything. But there's a layer on top of that that had, adds all these Hasura niceties to the API. So that's relationships in Hasura. And there's another little nicety I want to show you, which is enums. So when we were uh, defining this uh, uh, blog post activities uh, table here, um, I said how you know we had this, um, this type field here, which was text. But I did say that we expected this to have uh, you know, certain values. It's going to have values like created or published or whatever. And it would be nice if we could explicitly define that so that it's not possible for people to try and insert records that have some value other than that. And that's where enums come in. And uh, they are sort of, they're again, a sort of a database feature, but Hasura adds some extra kind of niceties on top that make the API uh, even nicer to work with because it understands these enums. And I'm going to show you how we can make an enum now for the uh, that blog post activity type. Whenever I show you this stuff, I think I should also mention that uh, I'm getting this stuff from uh, the Hasura documentation so that you know where to look uh, if you uh, need more information about this, uh, or you're doing this yourself in the future. Um, this is where I'm getting it from. I'll put the link to that in the description. So the first thing we'll do is we'll make another new table. And this one is going to be called blog post activity type. It's going to uh, represent all of those possible values that the blog post activities type column can hold. So I'm just going to create one column. Uh, I'll just call it name. I don't think it matters too much what it contains. And it's going to uh, be a text field and it's going to be the primary key. Uh, and that's it. So let's create that. Then we can insert uh, a few rows into this. So let's put in uh, created and uh, I'm going to put published and I'm going to put unpublished. Just do those for now. And then we can go back to blog post activity and I'll just simply add a foreign key. So uh, what we say is that the uh, that our type column is actually a foreign key into the uh, blog post activity type uh, name field. So that will restrict it. That means that all the values in this type uh, column have to match uh, one of the possible IDs, one of the, you know, the possible entries in the enum table. So let's save that. So far, so good. We've now added the restriction uh, that we wanted, which is that the, uh, that column can only contain uh, the, the values that we expect it to have. But again, that was all at the database level. We did that. You could, you could do that in a, in a Postgres database already. But uh, to help Hasura understand that that was an enum, um, it's also worth going to your uh, enum table again, go to modify and tick this box here, set table as enum. Okay. This again is something that helps Hasura to make the uh, API uh, even nicer uh, to work against. So what you'll find now is that if we were to uh, write a mutation to insert a blog post activity, and uh, let's go to type, you'll notice immediately it's going to uh, suggest the possible values. And you'll see also that you don't have to put uh, quotes uh, around this anymore um, because it's an enum. So you no longer think of it as a string, although uh, underneath it is. The final concept I want to talk about in this video is the notion of tracking. I've mentioned already how Hasura does try to keep some sort of separation between the database schema and then its own 
uh, API. Uh, one of the ways that manifests is that the tables that exist in your database don't necessarily have to be part of the uh, API. It don't have to be managed in some way by Hasura. Hasura refers to this as tracking. So we would say at the moment that all of these tables are being tracked by Hasura. They exist in the database, but also Hasura is tracking them, meaning that it's generating a GraphQL API uh, from those tables. And it, as a result, it's also uh, maintaining all kinds of other metadata, like for example, whether or not it's an enum, whether there are relationships between them and all sorts of other things later on, um, like authorization. To give you an example of what it would look like if we weren't tracking a table, I'm gonna click this uh, SQL button here, and this is just generally a useful thing to know about. Uh, we can um, send SQL commands directly to the database if we want to. So for example, I could uh, create a table, call it example table. Um, whoops. Just give it a couple of uh, made up fields. And um, you're gonna see that already Hasura is uh, it's very clever and already sees that it's a table creation and it wants to track it. I'm gonna untick that for the moment and run this and then click back on our public schema. And you'll see that Hasura tells you that it knows it's there, but it's under the untracked column. And what that means is that if we go into our uh, GraphQL, I mean, if I just look at the queries, for example, you'll see that there is no query for the um, example table that we just created. Whereas if I go back to here and I click track, that now means that Hasura is generating uh, an API for it. And so now you'll find that you can make queries for your example table. So that's Hasura's concept of tracking. Those are all the concepts that I'm gonna cover in this video. So hopefully you've got a rough idea now of how uh, you can use Hasura to manage your schema and some of the things that uh, Hasura does for you uh, on top of the database schema. So I'll finish by demonstrating the front end uh, that I've created and that you uh, should be able to, hopefully you've already cloned um, from the repo. Uh, again, the link will be in the description. So I'm gonna open up a new terminal. You will need NPM installed. Probably should have mentioned that um, previously, but I think probably most people will do already. But if you don't, you'll want to install Node.js and NPM. And uh, if you go into the front end directory, run NPM install, or NPMI for short, to install all the dependencies, and then NPM start to get it started. Um, if you're interested, it's a, uh, it's a React, very simple React app that was written with uh, the Create React App uh, tool. And this should launch a very simple front end on port 3000. And you can see I've already configured it with all the defaults. So uh, unless you changed your port numbers or anything like that, it should hopefully straight away uh, start showing you the blog posts that you uh, created through the uh, Hasura console. So you could go ahead and make more of those and they, um, they should work. You'll also see that your activity log is here. And uh, there's some other stuff that won't work yet, like we haven't dealt with um, you know, authentication. But as I was saying earlier, the very little work that we did today, uh, just uh, setting up the schema through Hasura's UI, um, already allows a front end like this to be reasonably functional. So I could create my second blog post. And we should find that this works. So I hope you enjoyed this video uh, and found it useful. Uh, I'd love to know uh, your feedback. Uh, please do subscribe if you enjoyed it. That's the main thing that's going to uh, help me to make more of these in the future if I'm able to um, start monetizing the channel. And uh, over the next few videos, I'm going to talk about events and actions, which are for implementing custom business logic. And then I'll move on to uh, authentication and authorization and topics like that. If you enjoyed this video and would like to help us to make more, please click the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.